Good morning, everyone. I trust you've all had a, a lovely week, not too tiring. And thank God it's Sunday. Uh, for those who are joining for the first time, this is Happy Week Community Church. We meet here every Sunday. Uh, we meet online on Wednesday. We'll talk about that uh, in detail later. Um, my name is Austin, and we'll just continue in the book we've been studying, looking at the book of John. But before we start, I just want to read this uh, uh, Bible passage, Psalm 100. And I want us to just to take it to heart to, as we flow in the service today. It says, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us. We are, he, we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Shall we bow down our heads and pray? Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you have made for us to see, to rejoice, and to be glad in it. And as we start to just fulfill this picture that you have just, just read, to come into your presence with thanksgiving, shouts of praise to you. We ask, for oh God, that no matter what is making our hearts heavy at these times, as we lay it at your feet, O oh Lord, we ask, O oh God, that you would help us to praise you just the way you want us to do. We ask, O oh God, that, Lord, you come into our midst and take full control of everything that's going to happen here today and speak to us as individuals. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing for Thank you. 
Father, we thank you that uh, even though we aren't perfect and we do screw up and we sin, uh, Lord, we thank you that we can come to you and seek your face and know your forgiveness. Lord, if again this morning we pray that you would cleanse us and make us afresh, new in your sight, and help us to listen to you and learn from you today. We praise you for your faithfulness and your great love towards us. Amen. Amen. Thank you all because you're a faithful God. And that's why, you know, we just express it from the bottom of our hearts, dear God. Thank you despite all the challenges that faces us or that confronts us. Thank you because we have this courage that because you are by our side, we shall overcome. Thank you for those times that we feel downcasted. And thank you for your word that comes to us, the wise so downcast my soul. Put your hope in Christ. Put your hope in me. Lord, we thank you, O oh God, because you will remain faithful. And as we continue in our service today, please help us, O oh God, to stay close to you, to hear you, and give us the will to go out and do your will. This we ask in Jesus' name. Let me just open our Bibles to John chapter 1. Read from verse 19. Now, this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied to the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. Now the Pharisees who had sent, who had been sent, questioned him, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one who, do not, who you do not know. He is the one who comes after me. The straps of whose sandals are not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan, where John was baptizing. We'll take another song now. After then, right, so come up and give us a word for today. <laughs> Thank you. 
through the book of John, and last week Chris opened that up, and it was talking specifically about Jesus being called the Word, and what that means, and the fact that he is the Word means that he was timeless, he was before creation, all creation was held together through him, and, and this week we're progressing in the book of John, and now we're, we're talking about someone who was born to be a witness. Now, a lot of times when we Hear the word witness, we think of things like a courtroom or a police report or something that, that somebody saw and they, they can give a first-hand account of what occurred. We don't use it in any other way usually than, than that in our time today. But, but when we talk about a witness here, we're talking about someone who was born to bear witness of the Messiah, of Jesus, the Son of God. And when we, when we look at the first time we see John the Baptist mentioned in, in the Bible, it's actually in the book of Luke, chapter 1. I'm going to read this passage here. It says, Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zacharias saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayers have been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you were to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many people of many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of of the parents to their children and to the dis and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So this is not the typical birth announcement. Usually when we think of a birth announcement, it's from the parents and they're telling everybody else that they're they're expecting and, and it's, there's a celebration that way. This way, the angel is telling Zachariah and Elizabeth, no, you're going to have a son, but this son is being born with a purpose. And the purpose is very simple. He is to proclaim Jesus, the Messiah. He's to prepare the way. Now, when we get over to the book of John, we see him introduced in John chapter 1, verses 6 to 8, where it says, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light, he came only as a witness to the light. And in the reading that we, we had, we just heard from, from Austin a few minutes ago, you have a group of Pharisees who send people over to kind of investigate and say, okay, um, why are you doing what you're doing? And, and one of the first things we see is John openly admit freely, one, he is not the Messiah. Two, he is not Elijah, and three, he is not the prophet. 
He wanted to make it clear he's none of the things that they were thinking of. He wasn't the Messiah. Even though he was different, he was living different, doing things different. And trust me, everything about him was different. The fact is he was living the, the, the life in the way of a Nazarite and, and the fact that he wouldn't cut his hair. He wouldn't ever drink alcohol. He would wear camel's hair and stuff like that, living out in the wilderness, eating wild honey, eating locusts. It's not one of those diets you hear talked about now, do we? It was different then and it's different now. But he was doing it for a purpose. And so when people start going, okay, are you? He's like, no, let me stop you right there. I'm not. I'm not the Messiah. I'm not Elijah. I'm not the prophet. Now remember, in the book of Luke, it talked about him coming in the power of Elijah. But what they're wanting to know is, is he the reincarnation of Elijah, basically? And he's going, no, you, you guys missed that prophecy. You're not understanding that correctly. So what does he say that he is? He says he's a voice. He talks about being a voice calling out in the wilderness. And as I was reading this week, one of the things that I, I noticed is they say, you have to understand this, that a voice had to declare the word. The voice had to declare the word, which we know last week, as Chris was pointing out, is Jesus. He was preparing the way ahead of time. I know this may, may seem like a, a strange analogy, but it's kind of like when they're building a new road, they don't just throw the new road down, do they? They have to prepare the way first. They have to scrape everything up. They have to level it out. They have to do all these things. That way, the, the road, when it's laid down right, is smooth and ready. And so John's trying to go, look, I'm trying to get you guys prepared as a nation of Israel for Jesus as he comes. I'm just the guy preparing the road. So when we look at this, one of the things that, that we see is a lot of differences happen. And one of the things that they bring up is, you know, why baptize? He says, why well, baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one who you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, who, uh, sorry, comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to one time. Because basically during this time, people always want to know, where are you getting your authority from? Why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you baptizing? And because understand this, in that culture, in that time, usually the only times they saw baptism was when you had a Gentile who was converting to follow the laws of Judaism, and therefore they would baptize themselves into this new life. But that's not what John was doing. John was preaching a, a baptism of repentance. Not that the water was doing everything. Just like now, the water is just a visual representation of what's happening in the heart. And that is they are saying, we repent of our sins. We want to leave that behind. We want to go a different way. And that is preparing the way for Jesus to be recognized in their lives. And so when they say, why are you baptizing? He's sitting there going, look, you guys are missing the point here. Because I'm just baptizing with water. But there's going to be one that comes. And he who comes after me. The straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. Now, if we think about it now, it may not have much cultural significance to us. I remember when I was a kid, sometimes like after church and stuff like that on a Sunday, my dad would be tired. He'd be like, can you just pull my shoes off for me? And so I'd walk over and I was a little kid. I'd pull the shoes off. We wouldn't think of that as a lowly thing now. But understand, during this time, the lowest of the lowest slave would do what John is describing here talks about untying the sandals and stuff like that. He is saying, look, I'm not worthy even to do the lowest job of a servant here when compared to Christ. So one of the things that we see is this pattern that starts coming up that he is sitting there pointing that Jesus is far above him, pointing that Jesus is the way he was preparing, just like the angel had said when he announced his birth in Luke chapter 1. He's trying to prepare people's hearts completely, wholeheartedly, not to confuse him with who is to come. His whole life could be summed up in a phrase, not I, but him. Not I, but him. And it's such an important thing because you think about it. 
John lived, according to what we would consider good standards, he lived a very good life. But he was not perfect. If there was ever going to be someone who would be tempted to try to, to take on more and get more praise, it would have been John. But we never see that in John's life. In fact, he constantly goes, no, it's not me I want you looking at. It's, it's Christ. And that brings us to verse 29 later on in the passage. It says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now understand this declaration is not just, we're so used to hearing the term Lamb of God, or as we read scripture, we talk about Lamb, that we, we may forget the significance, but understand, when he says, Behold the Lamb of God, or look, the Lamb of God, who took away, will take away the sin of the world, it would have rang in the ears of the people there. Because to them, automatically, they would have made a connection between the lambs that are used for sacrifice, for the sacrifice of atonement to forgive their sins, and what John is declaring. John is flat out declaring, this is the sacrifice that will complete it all. The first time he sees him, he declares this in front of people because he wants them to know right away, this is God's answer to our sin problem. This is God's answer to reconciling us with him. This lamb will be the sacrifice that was to come. And that sacrifice would take away the sin of the world. He was sent with the purpose just like John was, and John was purpose was pointing to him, and now he is declaring it openly in front of all people. Now, when we when we think about this, there, there's a lot that goes into it. And it will continue where it says, This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Now, this is obviously not talking about age right here. Because understand this, John was about six months older than his cousin Jesus. Because when we read through the book of Luke, we know that they were related. And he was older. In fact, the first time he hears the greeting of Mary, while he is in his mother's womb, he leaps. Because the Holy, he was already filled with the Holy Spirit. So here, he's not talking about the fact that, he, that he's older than him or something like that. He's saying, no, no, no. Jesus was always. So he is before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> I have seen and, te and I testify that this is God's chosen one. So now not only did he already know, but then God confirms this proclamation through what he witnesses there with the Holy Spirit coming down in the shape of a dove and resting on him. And right here, you just have this, this whole completeness of everything that John had been doing up until that point that he had been directed by God to all starts to fit together. It's like when you put that last puzzle piece in there and you're like, oh, okay, it's complete. But John's job wasn't done. He was to continue to proclaim because people were coming to him, but he's going, no, 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 you need to follow him. In fact, some of John's own disciples stopped following him and go and follow Jesus. And does John have a problem with this? No. He's like, oh, hey guys, remember, I'm not the Messiah. He is. I'm not the one you need to follow. He is. It's a wonderful testimony that we see from him because we see that everything about John's life was to be a witness, to testify that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. As we continue looking through, you know, most leaders, they, they, they want their following to grow, but, but John knows that this is not the way it's going to happen. In fact, when we go to chapter 3, start at verse 22, it says this. Sorry, I just lost my place. Oh, I missed the first day, that's fine. 
It says, after this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them. Now John was also baptizing at Aenea near Salem because there was plenty of water and people were coming and being baptized. This was before John was put in prison. An argument developed between some of the of Jesus, um, sorry, of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who you with who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he is baptizing, and everyone is going to him. To this John replied, a person can receive only what is given them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. He must become greater, I must become less. The one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. The one who comes, he testifies what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts this. But whoever has accepted it has certified that God <clears throat> is truthful. For the one whom God sent speaks the words of God and gives the Spirit without limit. The Father loves the Son and has placed everything in his hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. See here. John gives a picture to them so that they'll understand it in a different way because obviously they haven't gotten up to this point. They're sitting there getting jealous. Sometimes the followers of a leader get more jealous and more anxious for the leader than the leader themselves. Because it's like, almost like we want to know that we're following the right one. So we're going to defend things. And so they're going, hey, the one that you pointed to, the one that you testified about, they're baptizing now and everybody's going to them. And John basically is going, what's the problem? You're not getting something here. And so he gives them this, this picture of a bridegroom and a bride. And he's basically saying, look, basically I'm just the friend. The bridegroom is the one, and with the bride, that you, they get the attention. In fact, I'm just happy for the bridegroom. The attention is not supposed to be on me. Can you imagine going to a wedding, and in the middle of the ceremony, all of a sudden... The best man or the maid or matron of honor decides to get up and be like, hey, focus on me over here. We would be in shock, right? Because that's just not something you do. On that day, in that ceremony, in that circumstance, the bride and the bridegroom are the ones who you focus on. And he's going, this is the bridegroom. I'm not the focus. I'm just the guy who's sitting there trying to help make sure everything's okay for him. And then he must become greater and I must become less. It's a perfect illustration because when we put it in that context, it kind of makes a little bit more sense in, in a situation that we would relate to, right? He's going, look, I want all the attention to be on him. I need to fade into the background, but I'm still going to support him. Which if you think about it, a best man or a maid or matron of honor at a wedding, Throughout the wedding, they're doing things to try to help the bride and the groom out, right? And then at the end of the night, the bride and the groom, they leave, and you're just happy for them, and you're able to celebrate what God has brought together. And he's going, look, in this situation, I'm happy. I'll just keep on supporting them from the background. See, John, it wouldn't have mattered if everybody stopped following John, because he would have continued no matter what, to testify that Christ is the Messiah. And that is the thing. He gives us the perfect example of what being a witness for Christ is all about. He's the one who changes and transforms our lives. Therefore, our lives and words should all point back to him. A few months ago, we, we, covered, we were covering 1 Peter, and we talked about in 1 Peter chapter 2 about being living in a way that it testifies to 
through our relationship with Christ. That way, if anybody tries to accuse us, what they do is they end up seeing the works that we're doing and they realize that it's pointing to Christ. That's exactly what John is saying here. This is what we're supposed to be doing. If we call ourselves Christians, if we say that we follow Christ, that is our job, to be a reflection of him, not to be the focus. I was reading this week, and the guy, one of the guys who wrote the commentary said, you know, a lot of times we get caught up in the experiences of being a Christian and forget that the focus should be not on the experience, but on the person that we're following. We have to keep our focus on Christ 100% of the time. Why? Because he's the one who does the transforming. He's the one that does the changing. He's the one that is always faithful. And so we want everyone to focus not on us, but on him. That last verse again said this. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains in him. The last thing he does is he puts out this witness and he says, look, this is how you come to Christ. This is what we all must be doing, that we should believe in him, receive him. So the first thing that we have to do is realize it's not us, it's Jesus. We have to be a witness. If we call ourselves Christians, this should be the motto of our life, not I, but Jesus. We are to be a witness in every circumstance, in every situation. What if somebody comes attacking us? We have to defend Jesus, right? No, Jesus defends himself. He already has. We are to show the grace and the transformation that we've received through Christ and point people back to him. It's not about winning arguments or debates. It's about showing grace and loving others to where they can see what we have already received through Christ. The second thing is make sure that everybody knows that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the one who changes everything. He is the one that should be the focus. And what we have to do is believe in him, repent, and receive. Now, I'll be honest with you. I don't know every person in here. So there may be some people in here who are, are searching. Some people just have come for the first time. And you say, you know, I just wanted to see what it's all about. This is what it's all about. Jesus is the focus. The same one that John was proclaiming and testifying and preparing a way for is the same one that it's all about now over 2,000 years later. Jesus is the focus. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I encourage you to come and talk to one of us, either Austin or Chris or Jeff or myself. And that way we can answer any questions you might have. If you've already accepted Christ your Savior, then guess what? We have a job, and that is be a witness. The same witness that, that John was for Christ, we are to be the same witness today. Everything that we say, everything that we do should be pointing others to Christ. Is God expecting perfection? No, there's nobody perfect. But guess what? I've said it before, and I'll say it again. He provides the perfection through Christ. He gives us the Holy Spirit to give us the words and some conversations that may be very hard. And as we're trying to talk to someone, all of a sudden he'll bring a verse or, or something to mind. He'll sit there and go, you know, I've forgotten about that verse until that moment. We're not that good to remember all of it, guys. But he gives us the Holy Spirit to focus our minds and our hearts on him and give us the words to say, especially when we find someone that's searching. So if, as we walk away today, one of the things that we need to just remember is this. When we wake up, be a witness. As we go through our day, be a witness. As we're home or with friends, be a witness. Because even sometimes our own friends, who may be followers of Christ too, maybe they're struggling, and they just need to be reminded who the focus has to be on. And that's Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. For your love, Lord, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for the testimony of John, Lord. But the one thing that we get out of the testimony of John is it's not about him, it's about Christ. So, Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for that opening declaration that he made when he says, Look, the Lamb of God has come to take away the sin of the world. 
Lord, only you could have given a worthy sacrifice to atone once and for all. Lord, we thank you for your son. We thank you, Lord, because worthy is the Lamb. Amen. We hear that eternal life, life as it's meant to be, um, as it can be, is found, isn't it, in belief in Jesus Christ and not because of the cross. So let's finish thinking into the cross.
you know. Uh, so as I said, I'll just highlight some few things there. Um, on Wednesdays, we have our group meetings, and there's a session in the afternoon uh, at 2 p.m. So for that detail, if you want to see Jeff, Jeff, can you whip your hand, please? Yep. So we want to see Jeff talk about that. Um, in the evenings, there are two physical uh, ones, if you're not antisocial. <laughs> Physical ones uh, uh, for the North groups meet at Emily and uh, Graham's place, and for the South side meets at uh, Elena's and Chris's uh, place. If you want to have an idea where it's North, where it's South, please talk to Chris, you know, who's been here. And if you're social like me, we're on Zoom. So please, uh, we can all meet there on Zoom as well. And um, finally, uh, there is, for those who have uh, youngsters between 11 and 18, there's one of the copy of this is on there. Please, want to pick it up. The program for this time up to December is stated there so you know what the kids are going through between 11 and 18. And the normally meets on Sunday evenings at the Slate, that's, uh, will I call it a sister church? Yes. Slate? <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's Little Majolical. So if you just want to get a copy of that, for those who have not been attending, I call the kids to attend. I think it's always a lovely time, and they always have a pizza there. Yeah. Sorry? It's only once a month. Once a month, all right. Yeah, but they always have a pizza. So. <laughs> Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for all that we've heard today and all that we've sung to you. And we pray, oh God, even in line with what John said, that you might increase, that we can become less. So many of us might be struggling with habits or situations because we, we came, we're keeping you low and want to increase. But we ask, oh God, from this moment and for help us, oh God, that this be our prayer, that you will increase and we will become less so that we can be dead to self completely. And as you go from here, help us to be witness worthy of listening to you. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. Do have a lovely week. Uh, there's tea and coffee at the back. It's free. Uh, you can have that. And um, uh, if you are attending for the first time, there are two services. This is the first one. Second one starts at level 45. But please feel free to have the tea, coffee, or sugar rush at the back. That's fine. <laughs> Thank you.